on the training side, strength and conditioning, they would say to me that the quality rehabilitation for the athlete, the best return to performance programs, when the athletes in the late stage of their RTP programs, the training intensity should be so much higher than what they'd experience in season. All right, this is More Than Velocity. I'm Bart Pear here with Jordan Oseguera and Ryan Croton. And today we're going to talk about dealing with injuries in baseball. Uh, you know, arm care, you know, our goal is that we prevent those injuries and never happen. But, you know, baseball is a, um, a sport where injury is still going to occur. The, the throwing motion is a, you know, it's a, it's a severe motion at times. And, and so they happen. Um, and so, you know, it's one thing just to put somebody, um, patch them up and, and throw them back out there. It's another thing to do it right. So they're actually going out and performing better than they ever have. And so we're going to talk about all the aspects of things that you want to look at and make sure that your injury program or, or whatever is going on at, at your level, um, is touching all these points. So Ryan, I know you've had a lot of, um, seen a lot of different sides of, of dealing with injuries. Um, and, and I just wanted to kick this off with you and, and where should we start? If, if a player comes to you and they're injured, um, you know, what, what's your first step there? Yeah. I mean, I think the first place to look is that injuries are not only physical, but they're also mental and emotional. And, and my experience, I've had a chance to work with a lot of injured athletes at you know, all levels of professional baseball. Um, and they seem to have very similar thought processes after an injury. And so they, they live in two worlds. They live in one island, which is the what if, you know, what if I'm not good enough? You know, what if I don't get back to where I was? And, you know, what if the team releases me? You know, that's something that's in their mind. And then the, the other thing that kind of happens is that there's this kind of guilt and, and you know, um, just – ruminating on the past, you know, if only, you know, if only I did more arm care, if only I did, if only I slept better, you know, they, they, they live in these two worlds and, and they have to accept the present as far as where they're at. And the key is psychologically helping the athlete because their stress hormones such as cortisol can really prevent them from healing at a faster rate. And so, you know, part of I believe the recovery process for an athlete should involve sports psychology. Um, the, the body has to find its way to become relaxed. If it's always on high alert, um, your immune system can be compromised and it can affect, you know, the, the recovery of tissue. Um, you need uh, a staff that has a dietitian, in my opinion. So the, you know, nutrition component is super important in terms of what can happen with appetite, you know, and, and what kind of anti-inflammatory foods and um, tissue building foods are you, uh, are you eating? And then when you're dealing with the athlete, um, I talked to a really well-known uh, sports psychologist that's focused on recovery uh, from injuries. And she always said, like, when an athlete starts communicating about negatives, you have to say to them, how are those thoughts working for you? You have to do your best to break the cycle. Um, and so, you know, that, that was a really key piece. And the last piece for, you know, dealing with injuries is you need to name drop. Athletes need to know what other athletes have been successful with a similar injury. You know, and they, they're going to have a presentation of all sorts of injuries from like a calcified uh, UCL ligament you know, which is really tough to repair. There has been cases where athletes have overcome this and have gone on to a very successful major league career. So it's important in that period of time that you give good evidence that they're going to come out of this ahead. So just to rephrase, you're saying anyone who's got an, a, a physical injury that's severe enough to take them out of playing, um, you need to be aware that there's probably some emotional, psychological um, impacts to that injury as well. And those need to be addressed um, as you treat the physical side of, of that player. Yep, exactly. 
Awesome. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I think that makes perfect sense. And I definitely think it's something that, that is missed, especially at the, you know, the lower levels um, for sure. Um, let's break down just kind of the phases of rehab and how you treat someone and get them back to performing at the level they were before. You know, what, what are, are there stages that they go through that you want to make sure you're ticking the box and they're moving, making progress? Yeah. So there's always the acute stage. And, um, you know, the one thing that we want to call the whole process of rehabilitation. So in our, in my experience with professional baseball, I realized that rehabilitation as a word had a very negative con connotation. And so at least on the strength side, when we had the um, strength coach that was focused on rehabilitation, we called that return to performance. Um, the re return to performance coordinator. And, and that word started to circulate, you know, towards, you know, instead of the rehab, uh, uh, the rehab coach that was working with athletes, it was the return to performance coach that, you know, did their throwing programs and those things. So the, the whole communication of this process is the return to performance process. An athlete comes in with an acute stage of injury, their early onset, um, where you're, you're managing pain and range of motion restrictions. You know, and then as they transition, they get towards this late stage of uh, their recovery. And, um, you know, that's where someone like Jordan comes in, you know, people that start to work with the athlete on, on specific uh, skills. Um, but there, you know, there's a there's a process and even in training. So I'll just talk about training. And I think Jordan can really, you know, shed light on what happens with the throwing programs. but you have to go through the period of having isometrics. So we call it overcoming isometrics. And that's when you're utilizing a, a movable surface to recruit your muscles. And that can be, you know, using our, you know, I just think our dynamometer would be perfect for this. Um, you know, pushing into, uh, you know, if you have an arm injury and you need shoulder strengthening is pushing into, you know, a wall or a fixed object. Um, at varying degrees of intensity would be a great start to, to start to recruit the muscles again, because they are going to atrophy. You don't want to have such, you know, an atrophy is just a fancy word for muscle loss and, and strength loss. And then getting into light eccentrics and endurance, you know, that's the next phase. And then as we get to this late stage of the return to performance program, they get into strength. And we, we talk about something called yielding isometrics. And that's basically including um, you know, weights and, and different uh, exercises where it's not against a fixed surface, but you're essentially resisting going downward. So for example, if I had a knee problem and I'm training my patella tendon um, and I'm in a lunge with dumbbells, I'm basically holding that isometric and resisting, you know, going down to the floor. So that's the yielding isometrics. And, and you can also add slow eccentrics into those yielding isometric isometrics and start to develop strength. And at the furthest end, we need to be able to train power. This is when we're getting them really close to getting back with the team. They have to be able to do explosive movements. Um, they have to be able to do high speed eccentrics. Uh, they have to be able to do ballistics and, and, you know, ballistics is basically going back and forth in a movement as fast as possible, you know, and, and this is an area too, where plyometrics come into place with, you know, using plyo, plyo care balls and uh, trampolines and those kinds of things. So that's on the training side, but uh, I'll turn it over to Jordan to talk about what happens when they get reintroduced to throwing. So from my perspective, I, I want to hit a little more on that isometric side as well, because I'm a huge proponent of isometrics, regardless of where someone's at in, in, their, in their throwing progression, whether they're coming back from injury or whether they're just trying to prevent an injury, because the one thing I really like about asymmetrics is if there is an imbalance from front side, backside, or a specific area, you're really trying to hammer out. You can place them in that position. And like Ryan said, you can vary the intensities. You can vary the angle. And now you're isolating that muscle group that needs the stimulus to where you can't compensate in an isometric and use a different muscle group to get the result you're looking for. So I want to make sure that makes sense is especially when guys are coming back, it's there. Most people are getting hurt because they're fatigued and those fatigue, the fatigue is usually caused because there's an imbalance or a weakness somewhere. So when you get a guy in an isometric, you can really safely build that strength and set that foundation. And then like Ryan was kind of uh, 
implying to you there, there's some different levels you start hitting with that far end. And I might, I might misquote you here, but I think you said the far end of it is kind of that power and strength development, right? So yeah. isometric is kind of that foundation. And then you just keep layering on top of that as you go. And the one thing I really want to hammer out with guys in terms of the reintroduction to throwing, building out those programs is when you hurt something, you don't just, you know, check the box and say, Hey, we're through this phase. We never need to go back to that. And one of the, the great things that comes to mind is I'm a huge proponent of the Watkins program for low back injuries, or even just in general, build a guy's strength up through his core. I love the Watkins program. And I've had a lot of guys that I've worked with where they go, Hey, you know, I finished my rehab. I'm through Watkins level four. They said, I'm good to go. And then they never touched the Watkins Watkins program again for four five, six months. And then their backs hurt again. You're going to have to continually be doing these things. So I like to call it prehab and whether you're injured or not, you're, you're always in a prehab phase. And I like to use that as, as a warm up prior to throwing, get your throwing in and then get in there with a guy like Ryan and really get some serious training done after. But I like to use prehab in the sense is, is your pre throw. And then once you're introducing that guy to throwing, like Ryan said, there's a lot of psychological aspects uh, that go into that. And the better you set that foundation using isometrics, the better that throwing program is going to go in general. Uh, so before I answer your question, I want to make sure that I at least explain that well uh, so people can understand that, yeah, there's a high degree of importance to isometric training, especially regardless of what kind of program you're in. And it's not something that just disappears because you're, you, you finished your, you know, quote unquote therapy or whatever phrasing you want to use for that. Did, did I explain that? All right. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything you want to add in? Cause I know we could go on that for a while. I, I just, you know, I, I, I kind of want to touch base on, you know, you talked about prehabilitation and I think it's important, you know, the biggest predictor of injury is previous injury. So future injury can actually be worse if the previous injury isn't fully rehabilitated and if the athlete doesn't build a, a behavior to focus on it, you know, you don't want the athlete thinking I'm always injured. I'm always broken. I always got to work on this, but they just have to think this is part of my maintenance routine. It has to be part of their routine. Um, when they they've had, you know, a significant injury, you know, if it's, if it's a forearm flexor strain, you know, to give up on, uh, on uh, forearm flexor work that is pronation, supination based or eccentric based, you know, and stop doing those things and say, Oh, I'm going back to the weight room and I'm, I'm gripping everything. I'm doing pull-ups. I'm pressing. I'm, I'm doing deadlifting. You know, my grip is getting work, but you're forgetting that specific component. Um, they need to think that way. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what I, you know, I, I like that point that you touched on, but you know, we got to walk them through. Now they're getting on the field. Like you're, you know, they're picking up a ball, you know, what, what happens for them? Yeah. So the first thing is whenever someone's had that injury and I, I got to hammer home, there's going to be that psychological aspect. And we need to understand where that player's at psychologically from the mental and emotional standpoint of it. And even if day one, the programming is supposed to be, you know, 60 feet for three minutes or 90 feet for five minutes, whatever that programming is, get the feedback from the athlete on what it is they're going to be comfortable with doing. Cause it's, it's just like, you know, getting into the pool, learning to swim. It's not just straight into the deep end with this stuff. If an athlete is only comfortable, if they're fatigued a minute and a half at 60 feet, you can shut that down. Cause you're, you're, you're starting to build that back up. You don't have to. And I, I hate the phrase of just, you know, a lot of people just want to check those boxes in the rehab program and, when it comes to, 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 I like to say the word, like you said, return to performance. We're getting this guy back to performance. It's one baby step at a time, and you have to meet the athlete where they're at. You need to know where they are. You have an idea of what you want to accomplish and what the perfect day would look like, but I have yet to come across the perfect day in baseball. I've had some really good days, but most of them are not perfect. <laughs> like, again, I've had zero perfect days. So we got to be willing to pivot and adjust on what that looks like to make sure we're putting the athlete in a position to psychologically make a victory on the day. And it's more important that that guy makes three throws that he's really comfortable with as opposed to 30 throws that he's unsure about. Cause we're just rewiring that nervous system. We're rewiring the brain to go, okay, I'm comfortable with what my body's asking me to do. So I want to touch a little bit on what Jordan said, you know, around 
movement and hesitation in throwing. And there's a clinical term actually called kinesiophobia. And it's actually the fear of movement. And uh, athletes have to get through this during their, the return to performance stage. And, you know, of the event that they've experienced, so the, the psychological trauma of what happened to them, um, their potentially poor coping strategies and perception of pain, it causes neuromuscular guarding and soft tissue restriction of movement. Um, and that's the whole complex of kinesiophobia. And, and really the underlying problem is that there's a fear of re-injury. And what I've seen in my experience working with injured athletes and, you know, just essentially just putting sensors on them is that they tend to have a similar biomechanical movement that they had had when they were injured. So there's something about not going beyond their current motion um, in terms of protecting them during when they throw. So, you know, that, that's one of the things that I see through that uh, kinesiophobia lens and where I see biomechanics fit is to be able to determine, hey, what did the athlete look at look like before, especially when they're healthy? Um, what did they look like when they, you know, sustain an injury? And then what happens during the rehabilitation process? And I know that's a bit of a challenge. And, you know, maybe, uh, Jordan, you could kind of hit on, you know, how, how you have particularly helped athletes get through the kinesiophobia in returning back to throw. So just kind of touching back on what I was going over um, a little earlier today, obviously, was you, you just meeting them where they're at, understanding what is it that is stressful and anxiety for that athlete. And then how do you go about addressing that? Every player is going to be a little different. If, you know, the first initial stages, you're just kind of feeling it out. I kind of use the, uh, the, the example of kind of, kind of putting the toe in the water. You don't want to just jump right into the deep end. Let's wait into the shallow end. Let's slowly get out there. Let's make sure we're comfortable with what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, we're when, when we're coming back to performance, we're not we're not playing a short term game. This is a long term focus because ideally we never want this situation happening again. So we want to make sure that we're getting them in situations, whether that is a drill, whether that is a distance of the throwing, to where you meet them where they're comfortable. And you find where that movement is going to be optimized. And, you know, we talked previously on, you know, evaluating the kinematic sequence. You want to find what's going to get you the desired outcome. And then you, you hammer that out where they're comfortable with it. So if all it is, is, you know, a popular drill that almost everybody knows, you know, some people hate it. Some people love it. That's not the point of this topic, obviously. But if the rocker drill is the drill that puts that player in the optimum kinematic sequence and mentally they're in a good state hammer out a ton of, uh, of the rocker drill, whatever drill helps that athlete from the psychological and the physical side is the one you want to be working with. And just like Ryan said, you know, a lot of the context is we want to know what did that athlete look like when they were going really well and healthy? What did that athlete look like when they were just prior to injury? And then where's the common ground between those two things of where that optimized movement is. If we don't have 3d motion analysis tools, then we yeah. need to be able to take that information and design our drills and our throwing programs to optimize that movement. Uh, so I want to make sure I'm really clear on that, that just because uh, a throwing program on the way back says 120 for eight minutes with these three drills, or we're throwing a bullpen today. If that athlete is mentally and emotionally not ready for that, you're not doing them any good by pushing them on that end. There's a time and a place for pushing a player on those mental emotional limits. And it's when they're fully healthy. It's when they're ready to go. It's when they've already been built up. You know, we talked about the pitch smart guidelines. It would be after they've, they've crossed all those bridges on the pitch smart guidelines. They're built up. They are ready for competition in the season with no restriction. But if there's still any restrictions on there, you really want to make sure you're not overextending where that athlete's at psychologically. Yeah. I'm, I mean, the other thing too, is like, we're trying to build confidence. And uh, I'm kind of talking from a professional baseball lens, but I think this extends to also amateurs in terms of, you know, the word pain. We have options in terms of the words we choose. You know, um, I, I think a better word during the, uh, the return to performance phase for, for athletes is discomfort. Do you have discomfort? Because if you start talking about pain. Um, again, it feeds into this kinesiophobia. It's a, it's a harsh word where discomfort 
is something where the athletes knows, okay, well, I can get through it. doesn't feel a hundred percent, but I can get through it. And the communication, like I remember working with a couple of major league players and during their um, return to performance uh, phase of, of their injury, they kept complaining that, you know, all we talk about and all we talk to are medical officials. You know, they're having conversations with the physical therapists, the athletic trainers, the doctors, and they need more support, you know, from their coaches, um, from their coordinators, the people that are, you know, overseeing their, their actual competitive programs. And I think that's important too, that they need encouragement. In one particular case, um, our GM actually sent the, the player a very uplifting poem. And it, it was just really monumental to see the change in this athlete's approach to the rehabilitation process where there was a lot of hesitation and there was, it was very monotonous for this athlete. Um, the athlete wanted to be doing his rehabilitation at home to be with his family, his significant others. And when he received this message from the general manager, it's like, man, we want you back. We, we, we miss you. We're, we, we need you to work. We need you back. Here's a poem that has helped me when I was struggling and I'm going to give it to you. Um, and it just made the world a difference in overcoming those fears. So that's important too, is that confidence and getting it from multiple sources can really push an athlete forward and advance the rehabilitation. Yeah. Just to jump on that is it's so important. Um, luckily during my time coaching in collegiate baseball, I didn't really deal with any arm injuries when it came down to stuff like that. I got, you know, I feel really blessed to not have to deal with that, but on the professional level, there's a lot more injuries and, you know, you hear all these guys talking, Hey, you know, we went at the college level, we got 15 seasons as a coach and I've never had a surgery. Also the context of what's going on, there's a lot different, you know, but in the, in pro ball, a lot of times you're getting guys that are already hurt. So there's a lot more, you know, returning to performance. Those guys are a lot more overworked. You're managing a lot more players. And a lot of times, because there is so many players, those guys can just fall by the wayside. And all of a sudden they feel like they're on an Island. You know, you use this analogy of these islands that are out there and they feel they are on, you know, the misfit toys. If anyone's seen, what is that? Rudolph? Is that Rudolph mm -hmm. Bart? You're a little older than me. You'll know those ones, but uh, you know, they year, without like, a, year without a Santa Claus, maybe I'm trying that to might remember. be the one too. I can't yeah. remember. It's one of those like felt the animations. A misfit if you haven't seen yeah. it, why not? Maybe we can link that somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh um, anyways, they feel like they're on the Island of the misfit toys, you know, and they just, nobody cares about them. Nobody knows what's going on. And if all a coordinator does in the professional setting is check in with that player and go, Hey man, I want to know, we're thinking about you. We're ready for you to get back, but take your time. We have enough guys to help us out right now. What well, we want, what's best for you, which is going to in turn be what's best for the organization and have that communication. And it's no different in the college setting where a lot of times, you know, if a guy goes down, the more communication that manager or that pitching coach or whoever it is that's not just the medical staff is communicating with that guy, the better that morale is going to be. Um, and again, I've used a lot of different like military stories and things like that because I've had a lot of family that's been in the military. I've had coaches that were in the military and, you know, I've, I've got family members that, you know, were in the army, you know, in in the Middle East. And one of the things they were saying is one of the, when, when guys were laid up in bed because they had been injured in combat was when, again, I'm going to screw it up, but the, the general or whoever's in, in control of that entire infantry unit would come in and be, Hey, look, I know you're hurt. You want to get back out there. We need you at hundred percent before you, before you can, because number one, we don't need you getting hurt even worse. And number two, you can't contribute unless you're back to full strength. So simple messages like that, not just in that atmosphere, but guys have that same camaraderie that they're on the front lines battling with their guys, even if it is just baseball, but they want that feedback. They want to be reassured that we still are thinking about you. You're not just a number on paper. And that plays a huge role in the psychological factoring of it. But it needs to be authentic. I mean, poems are not required. If you, that's not your thing, you can, you can speak from the heart another way. Exactly. And that's, that's the other big thing too, is I, I know it's like, kind of tongue in cheek on there, but if you're getting a poem from me, you know, it's fake. You know, if you're getting a poem <laughs> from Ryan, there's probably some thought behind it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So um, let's talk about goals and, and benchmarks and, you know, everybody wants to get back as fast as possible, but there's also, you know, some stages you've got to go through. What, what are you, 
what are the right things to be communicating to that player and, and expectations and those type of things and, and making sure that they're, they're making progress. If they have a setback, it's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. And, and, and what's, what's going on there? How do you deal with that? Yeah. So, you know, the first, the first uh, experiences that I had in, in a new job with the angels is that we had to figure out a way in which we communicated a schedule to the athlete so that they had some, some idea of what is needed at certain phases. We didn't, what we didn't do <clears throat> is give a particular date, yep. you know, on January 1st, da, 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 it'd be like within two months, we need you to be able to do X, Y, and Z. Um, because the athlete needed some guidance rather than not giving them any kind of indication of where they are going. Um, athletes are, are inherently competitive with themselves. So, you know, if you, if you give them some indicator of where they need to be, they're going to want to exceed that. They're going to want to usually work hard towards, you know, beating that particular, uh, goal date. <clears throat> but the other thing that's so important about having these, uh, these goals and especially the scheduling is for load management. You know, a lot of the problems that uh, I've seen in the rehabilitation process, whether it's setbacks or what we call secondary injuries, so injuries not related to the primary injury, and then chronic injuries being the primary injury manifesting another injury again, again it, it occurs from not having the right buildup of load. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that I want to communicate, you know, on, on this podcast is that we need to also understand the neurological condition of the athlete. So we give them the right amount of load. You see in the, in the RTP process, the return to performance process, if you're not challenging the athlete enough, you're going to be holding them back. And consequently, if you give them too much more, you might create a setback. that's not progressed well. So, you know, tying it back to, uh, to our device and our platform, you know, being led during this particular time, we, we stencil, you know, we know what the athlete's strength was before they got injured. Hopefully we did everything we possibly could to utilize the app to prevent the injury from happening. But if it did happen for whatever reason, beyond the control of just, you know, improving their strength, we have a benchmark to know when they're ready. And we also have the benchmarks that are going along during their RTP process to be able to manage the work we give them. So that gives us a real high quality insight in terms of, you know, today, hey, your strength is really good. And I had this really, you know, th this was a, a tick lower than, you know, where you should be at. I think we can increase this. You're feeling good. Your strength levels are high. You're motivated. Um, you, you don't have discomfort. Let's let's push this forward a little bit. And I think the world of, of return to performance rehabilitation is heavily focused on external load, counting reps, counting the intensity of reps, um, you know, measuring velocities. Those things are important, but the underlying importance of all of it is the physical realm of the athlete. And that's where I think our, our platform is going to be unbelievable for the return to performance programs uh, across all levels of baseball. We've already seen it used in, in that aspect at the university level. Uh, one of the university, I'm going to paraphrase, obviously, but Stephen F. Austin was using it with some of their guys who had to stick around for the summer because they were, they were on the IL. They were rehabbing some arm things going on. And once they started getting their guys on the system and they were testing strength relatively consistently, and I was able to keep in touch with that AT who was in charge of that really bright guy. Uh, but he started dialing in those throwing programs, dialing in the conditioning and what they had a windowed out for X amount of weeks. They were able to lessen that time. And now those players are going to come back and be competing in the fall to get that playing time as opposed to yeah, maybe mid fall, they're going to be back. So if you're able to monitor and adjust and understand the days you can push that athlete a little more, or you have to back off a little bit. Now you're not hitting those, those workload issues when it comes down to it, that, that caused that re injury or a new injury to occur, something completely unrelated. And the better you monitor, the better you adjust, you're able to set that foundation. And now you're preparing yourself 
for those issues that could lie ahead. Um, I want to make sure I explain that. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the strength side of things. So I have a few friends that are in the AFL in the Aussie rules football league. Um, and on the training side, strength and conditioning, they would say to me that the quality rehabilitation for the athlete, the best return to performance programs, when the athletes in the late stage of their RTP programs, the training intensity should be so much higher than what they'd experience in season. And they would say that if they, if they're able to accomplish that, the player that is returning back on the field, especially for high speed running, um, really had a, a very small level of recurrent injury. And the, the problem, you know, that I can foresee sometimes what I'd see in baseball is that, you know, the training would be matching in season. So, you know, you'd have a workout that would be 40 minutes max, you know, sometimes less. That's not going to be sufficient in the weight room. And, and definitely, you know, when we're talking about arm care, um, you know, there has to be a heavy strength emphasis, heavy eccentric emphasis, um, a heavy endurance emphasis. Like their arms will be tired, but they're developing capacity, you know, and all along you're testing this. So it's, it's really important. You know, the people that are in the medical world, um, your return to uh, performance throwing coaches, you know, your strength coaches that are working with the athletes, they need to be aware of this data, you know, and they also have to be goal directed for the athlete. It's not just an athlete focused uh, platform. The, the, the coach has to be goal directed as well and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to get him to meet those expectations and exceed them. You know, so, you know, that's what I'm really excited about. I can't wait for feedback. You know, hopefully we don't get a lot of injuries out there, but I can't wait for feedback on how well um, our platform will lead the the medical officials, the people that are behind the athlete uh, in terms of their recovery to improve. And I also communicate with a couple of major leaguers who utilize our platform um, and they're going through the RTP process now and they've been amazed you know, they've, they've really had, they've had lower body injuries and they're making sure their arms are bulletproof through this entire process. Yeah. I want to jump on that real quick too, because you mentioned eccentric training and I know we've talked about eccentric training in the past. And I just want to refresh on that because I am a huge proponent of not just isometrics, but also eccentrics. And it's the two things in baseball that really kind of get overlooked especially with right now, everyone, and there's nothing wrong with it. As long as you're ready, you know, cleaning, pressing, Everything else that goes into it, you know, squatting, you know, deadlift, heavyweight, all that stuff is great. But for me, in terms of bulletproofing, isometrics and eccentrics, you really can't place your bet better than that when it comes down to it. And especially if you're coming back from something, lower half, upper half, and you're in a no throw period, or if you just finish the season and you want to get into your prehab phase and you're in a no throw uh, period of your, you know, buildup phase, hit the eccentrics. Like it's the only thing you're doing because you're going to get really stiff. You're going to get really sore. That's the big complaint. Oh, well, I don't feel fresh after I I did eccentrics. Well, that's because you did them right. You know, and that's where people get hurt is on those eccentric phases. So you really have to beef up that eccentric ability when it comes to the way your muscles work and that concentric, eccentric, and isometric. Getting the concentric stuff is easy. That's your standard everything. Nobody does isometric, not nobody, few people do isometric and few people really hammer out the eccentrics, but doing those. And I'm going to take the phrase from, you know, my, me and Ryan's former general manager with Billy Epler, you either want to pay now, or do you want to pay later? Even if you're in the middle of the season, it's going to be worth it for you to do some eccentric work because you want to pay for a little bit of stiffness and soreness now while your body adapts to that. Or do you just want to wait until later and have to pay for it when something does go wrong? So the better you put money into that bank early on, the more dividends and the better interest you're going to start getting off those eccentric and isometric deposits, if that makes any sense. I tried to use another analogy there. Yeah. I I mean, we have a blog out there. So I know you mentioned soreness, but there's been research to show that if you progress eccentrics right, um, you don't have to experience soreness. We have a blog out there on myth-busting eccentric exercise. Um, and I, I think everybody who's listening to this should should read it because there's some really great information on what eccentric exercise can do for the brain 
um, the body and uh, being progressed well, the athlete will, will really uh, increase their tolerance. And what people don't know is the eccentric exercise that builds arm speed because it, it lengthens the fascicles, which are, you know, components of our muscles. And when they get longer, they contract at a faster rate. And you can't get that with any type of exercise like iso like isometrics or concentric exercise. So the eccentrics, the lengthening contractions are really important. And when it comes to your arm, you know, they, they don't need to be um, long standing eccentrics, you know, two to three seconds to start and develop, develop the strength. Um, but yeah, we, we need to bulletproof the arm. And, and I have a friend in, uh, in volleyball, he, he works for USA volleyball and he'd always say stronger athletes are harder to kill. And I want to adapt that and say stronger arms are harder to kill. And we need to, we need to be able to get there, uh, especially for the injured population. They can't afford to have a re-injury. You know, what people don't know is that, okay, let's talk about Tommy John surgery, Tommy John surgery, your rate of return is like 85%. Most athletes, you know, pro athletes, they've done research on pro athletes. I, I don't know the, the actual stats for amateurs, but 85% of them come back to their level of play or better. The problem is if you have a re-injury, so that primary injury, you know, the ligament uh, reconstruction only lasts uh, on average, you know, you know, three to five years. So you have to take care of it. And, and, you know, if you have a re-injury, your rate of return is far less, you know, almost half. So that's why we got to prevent these, these future injuries and, and good rehabilitation has to be at the forefront of people's minds. I want to, I want to touch on that real quick too, because you see a lot in a general theme in baseball is nobody's worried about the elbow injury. Oh, well, you come back just as good. You know, you got a really good chance and they take a couple guys, a handful of guys that came back throwing harder. Oh, well, you come back throwing harder from Tommy John surgery. No, they actually just addressed your weak links. They fixed you up. Imagine if you would have done that before needing surgery. Yep. Not only would you be healthy, but you'd be throwing harder and you wouldn't have most likely your parents wouldn't have had to pay however much it cost to have a surgery. So the three to five years is really important because if you're 16 and you get a Tommy John, and then you come back and say you do get in better shape. You do get stronger. You do clean up some throwing inefficiencies. And now you're throwing, let's just say it's, it's awesome. And you're 95, 97, and you get three to five years out of that. Now you're still not out of a ball. So now it's like, Hey, cool. You have two Tommy Johns and you never pitched out of a ball. What good did you really do? And again, you want to pay now or pay later. And there's this, it's not as common as it used to be, but there is a common thought in baseball that people just go, I'll just go get a Tommy John. It's not that big a deal. I'll just, I'll do this. I'll, I'll throw with max effort all the time. I'll do this. I'll do that. And the next thing you know, it doesn't quite work out quite like the Tommy John fairy promised it would. And they're leaving a little bit confused at the end of the day. And I, I if you want to go more in depth on that ride with that three to five years and exactly why people need to pay that money on the front end, by investing in their own development to make sure the strength base is there as well as everything else that goes into uh, recovery of, of a, a prehab sense with nutrition, biomechanics, and you're going to be able to give a lot more depth on that. Uh, but I just think that's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. I, I mean, talking at the major league level, they have the most success when a major league player, not a minor league, a major league player sustains an injury, their, their rate of return um, is, is higher and their long-standing career is longer. So like when you look at pitcher stats online, you can pull, pull up most pitchers. You'll see that there's probably a blank line in their stats. So you can see that they've had a season off, you know, like, and you just look at Tommy John. If you look at Tommy John, who's you know, coined the Tommy John surgery, when after the surgery, he pitched for a number of years. I think it was like 10 or 12 years. It might be even more after his surgery. And I think he developed the processes, the, the, the training um, to be able to withstand that. And so, you know, the thing that we offer that the major league player gets is they, they have significant observation, you know, usually in the professional, the major league level rehabilitation, there's a, an athletic trainer or a physical therapist assigned to you. There's a director of medicine that's a, that 
those people are working with. There's a lot of people observing the athlete, communicating about their rehabilitation process. It makes it very successful, you know, and then on the amateur side, the minor league side, you know, sometimes they don't have the same observation, you know, we're giving, you know, we're giving them not only, I think a training tool in our, our dynamometer, dynamometer, but we're giving them a clinic in a case, you know, we're bringing them that advantage of knowing where they stand constantly being able to, you know, adapt their, their training program. So, you know, I have very good confidence in, in where the world is going to go with our platform when it comes to rehabilitation, because now the athlete, they sustain the injury, they remediate the problem and now ongoing for their entire career, they are never going to lose data points to know when they need to make an adjustment. You know, so, so we're going to see, I believe a wave with the use of our platform and seeing less injuries and for the other ones that do get injured, we're going to see better outcomes, in my opinion. For sure. And just, just to give a little more depth on that, when you're saying the longevity of the big league injury is way better than the minor league or the amateur injury, I want to make sure I understood that right, correct? Yeah. And one of the main reasons behind that is when you're a professional organization and you've invested – into that major leaguer, you're paying him, even if it's just the minimum, you're paying that one major leaguer more than you're paying 30 minor leaguers. So when that car is not able to get out of the garage, you better get that car out of the garage quick because that is going to Im- impact the way that you win ball games at the major league level. If you're not winning games at the major league level, everybody gets fired and everybody goes home. So that's why they have a higher success rate is they're going to invest the resources. They're going to invest the time. They're going to invest all that energy into making sure that player who's you purchase specifically to win ball games is going to be back. We're on the minor leaguers. They're, they're in a sense placing those bets for a long-term, maybe in five years, this guy's going to be ready. Maybe in seven years, he'll be ready. Maybe in three years, but at the major league level, they want them ready now. And they impact tomorrow and they impact today of what's going to be happening between those lines in the stadium. Whereas what's going on in, in low A or your complex is very far away from where, where the big leagues is. So they're going to keep that focus on what's going to impact us today. And that's my belief as to why those guys have a better success rate in terms of longevity as opposed to the minor league player or the amateur player is they're getting millions and millions and millions of dollars invested in them. Where if you're just a 16-year-old in you know whatever state it may be, are you getting multi millions of dollars invested into your return to performance or is it just at the the general clinic once you're cleared now they're turning you loose on your own and you're left to your own devices so ideally one of those own devices would be a way to monitor and assess and make sure that you're progressing so you don't have that relapse um so i just want to be clear on that that the reason you're probably seeing a lot of that is there's a lot more vested interest of everyone involved for those big leaguers to be producing. Not only that, but if you're, you know, if you're a high school junior and you're undergoing Tommy John, you've just drastically limited the track record that a college scout or pro scout has to evaluate you because you've been out for such a, you know, a huge part of your time. Even, you know, even if it's ideal when you have the surgery or do those things, you're still, you're still taking a big risk there um, of just missing out on recruiting because they, they don't have the track record to make a good evaluation of you to, to take a chance on you. Exactly. It's a big, it's a big concern. You know, people might not know this. There's, there's been a study that come out um, and we have it in our course, our foundations course, it's coming available soon. But in the ages of 15 and 19, there's been an explosive increase more than any other competitive rank, level, or age in Tommy John surgeries. They are happening at an alarming, alarming rate. And so, you know, in order to lessen this, you know, lessen missed opportunities, you know, um, especially, you know, you think of a college player, even if he does get recruited, while he's hurt and he's got to do his rehabilitation in college, you know, that's a, that's a tough period for them because now they only have two years per se, or a redshirt year, they get older to showcase themselves, you know, and, and the whole game 
with professional baseball is getting through the minor league ranks at a younger age. You know, you, you want to get to the major leagues as a younger age because now you have a lot more of a time window to get to your peak. If you get to the major leagues and now you're 27 and, and baseball has shown the peak age of performance is 29 years old, you don't got a lot of time to, to showcase yourself, especially to make money. Um, and so we, we need to protect this, this adolescent age group. Um, they're throwing harder. The bodies are bigger. Remember, they're going through peak height velocity. We've talked about that from the age of 12 to 16. These kids are growing at a very fast rate and there's a lot of load put on their bodies. And, uh, you know, we need to do something about that. And I think that's a, that's a driving mission for us at armcare.com. All right. I think, um, We've, took, we've taken injuries, looked at it a lot of different ways. Um, I'm glad we touched on Tommy John there and, and really the, the perception of that and how that's, it is changing, but it needs to change a little more. Um, if you've got any questions, first of all, go ahead and subscribe to us. Make sure you don't miss out on any of the, um, the other future podcasts coming. But if you've got any questions, just hit us up um, on our site, armcare.com or on our YouTube channel, and uh, we'd love to talk to you guys and we'd love to, we'd love to answer them. So until next time, take care.